the very first high-level meeting of US and Chinese diplomats under the Biden administration began and ended with a frosty note. As US Secretary of State Antony Blinken wasted no time in pointing out the Chinese government's treatment of Muslims in Xinjiang, its claims over Hong Kong and Taiwan, and its cyber attacks, Chinese officials reacted in anger, accusing the US of hypocrisy and disrespect towards Beijing, and slammed America's model of democracy. After two days of talks, the two sides went their separate ways, with nothing to show for, just an exchange of heated words and accusations that only confirmed their differences. Was there still any kind of significance to this meeting? And amid this standoff of superpowers, where does this place countries that are wedged in the middle? Joining me today for the discussion is John Nilsson Wright, Korea Foundation Career Fellow at the Chatham House and Senior Lecturer of Modern Japanese Studies at the University of Cambridge. We also connect with Riley Walters, Japan Chair Deputy Director at the Hudson Institute. A very warm welcome to you both. And, well, to start off the discussion, let's uh, start with you, John. Now, it seems that China really wanted this meeting quite badly. Um, they were obviously trying to catch Anthony Blinken on his way home from his Asia tour from South Korea. And uh, they called this a high-level strategic dialogue before the meeting happened. Do you think the Chinese were expecting the meeting to be so confrontational? And what do you think they were hoping to get out of the talks? I think on the issue of confrontation, there was a lot of telegraphing before this meeting. Of course, the Americans had singled out 24 Chinese officials for sanctions on the basis of um, America's view that China is violating the human rights of uh, the citizens of Hong Kong. Um, that was made very clear beforehand, so the Chinese won't have had any illusions that this was going to be a tough meeting. But as you rightly point out, their emphasis on trying to frame this as a strategic dialogue is an attempt, I think, to highlight what the Chinese would view as a kind of equivalent status of the two countries, um, to present them as the principal players in, the, in deciding the geopolitics of the region and broader global issues. The Americans, by contrast, of course, are trying to not only stress the importance of their existing alliance relationships, but also signal their red lines when it comes to their belief that China is a disruptor. Uh, and on those critical areas where they feel they need to confront China, um, whether it's on human rights, um, on the broader concerns about China's military expansion in East Asia, um, on all the, of those critical strategic and political issues, the United States wants to take a tough position from the very beginning. It doesn't mean that cooperation isn't part of the process of discussion and behind closed doors outside the framework of the public side of this meeting, which is, as you noted, was quite acrimonious, uh, there will have been an attempt, I'm sure, to discuss common issues such as North Korea, Iran, Afghanistan, climate change. There are areas where the two sides can cooperate. But um, this was frosty, and I think it's a measure of how far apart the two countries are and how much effort the Biden administration is putting into trying to assert its red lines and to um, mark a sharp departure from the outgoing Trump administration. And Riley, of course, the Chinese officials, they complained about how the US had placed uh, sanctions on uh, Chinese government, work, um, government officials over its uh, claims on Hong Kong. And oh, with this very high level meeting of US and Chinese officials you know, ending on a very sour note, do you expect trade talks to resume anytime soon? Or do you think it's going to worsen? And um, in the meantime, how has the phase one deal between the two countries been doing? Well, the, the phase one deal hasn't been uh, being adequately met, uh, as both the U.S. and China agreed to it uh, at the beginning of last year. Uh, if we look at the data right now, China has made only about 60 percent of the goods purchases and maybe about 50 percent of the service purchases it was supposed to make last year. Of course, some of that can be blamed on the global pandemic. Uh, and so that is why more talks are necessary. But to have talks, expect talks anytime soon. I, I don't expect talks anytime soon, uh, not just because of the sort of heated rhetoric we saw come out of this most recent meeting, but for the fact that uh, in the United States, we just recently confirmed our U.S. trade representative, um, Catherine Tai. She, Ambassador Tai has now have to come in and, and establish her team, and it's going to take a while um, for them to review, I think, the deal and determine what they actually want to do with it. And so I, I wouldn't expect it anytime soon, even though 
they really do need to and they're really supposed to as a part of this deal. And Riley, China seems quite confident of its um, economic growth plan for the next five years. It's claimed to have overcome poverty and it's expecting to become the world's largest economy by 2035 and leading high-tech sectors with its homegrown technology. What did you make of its new economic plan that was announced earlier this month at its uh, two sessions? And do you think the US should be worried at this point? I think the uh, U.S. is generally worried uh, about some of the policies that are coming out of Beijing. And I don't think it's just the United States who is worried. Um, you know, the, the rhetoric and just the, the tone and even just the general direction of policy coming out of Beijing uh, seems more uh, illiberal, more heavy handed, uh, heavy hand government intervention by Beijing. And so this this has a, a huge implication for stifling uh, innovation and uh, foreign competitiveness. You know, there's a lot of U.S. and Korean and European investment in China. And, you know, if, if Beijing continues to go down this road, I, I, I'm really concerned about what could happen. Now, what, what actually came out of Beijing, these uh, sort of this talk about uh, new policies such as the dual circulation, which uh, encourages both domestic consumption and exports, uh, is by its nature anti-competitive against foreign uh, companies, and so um, I, I, I have, I, you know, I'm a little bit worried what this means uh, for future economic relationships with China. I think it's going to make things more difficult, uh, and I think I think Washington sees this. And now, John, there's been quite a lot of interest in whether South Korea will join America's informal uh, security alliance called Quad. Yet. Um, South Korean and U.S. officials, they didn't really make a mention of it during their, um, after their high-level talks last week uh, during the press conference. And when asked about it by a reporter, uh, the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, sort of sidestepped the question, saying that Quad is just an informal alliance. Do you think this was discussed between the two sides? And do you think it might be a bit harder to get South Korea fully on board with the pressure campaign against China than its neighbour Japan? There is a very real difference between Seoul and Tokyo on the issue of China. Um, the Korean government, and not just this government, but previous governments, have wished to avoid being drawn into an adversarial relationship between the United States and China. That's partly driven by economic necessity, uh, given the heavy dependence of South Korea on the Chinese market in terms of trade and investment. Um, you will have seen from the, the joint readout of the meetings in Seoul that both sides emphasize the importance of coordination of free and open Indo-Pacific strategy of the United States on the one hand, and President Moon's new southern policy, which of course is focused very much on Southeast Asia. And that's, I think, the area where you can expect to see a broadly defined strategic cooperation between the United States and South Korea. Uh, but South Korea will want to maintain its long-standing position of strategic ambiguity when it comes to taking sides on the China issue. Um, and I think that makes sense for uh, political and diplomatic and, of course, those political economic reasons. It doesn't mean that there won't have been discussions about the ways the two countries can perhaps enhance their security interests. I'm sure the question of fat deployment, missile defense, will have been part of those private discussions. But in terms of the communique, there was a very different emphasis in Seoul from in Tokyo, where the Japanese were much happier to take a much tougher line on China alongside the United States. And of course, a critical challenge for the US is getting its biggest allies in the Indo-Pacific, South Korea and Japan, to really work together despite their differences. Um, so John, do you see hope for, a, uh, for stronger trilateral ties, especially now that uh, Mr. Trump and Mr. Abe are both out of the picture? How can the US really get South Korea and Japan to work together? It's a real um, headache, I think, for the Americans. And just to sort of follow up from the previous question, worth mentioning, that of course, China in the context of South Korea, um, U.S. relationships remains very important because China, as Secretary of State Lincoln pointed out, is potentially very important in helping to develop, to deliver a more accommodating or a more responsive North Korea. I mean, this is the area where, of course, Seoul and Tokyo should be working much closer with the United States. But the problem is the depth of tensions over vexed historical issues uh, left over from the colonial period, resurrected by the incoming Moon administration in 2017, 
I don't think one can minimize the extent of both elite level and public disaffection on both sides of the EC, the Sea of Japan, as it's known in Japan. Um, this is a real problem. Um, and also it's partly because the previous Trump administration uh, wasn't willing to invest much, if any, political capital in trying to bring Tokyo and Seoul closer together. One of the reasons why um, Secretary of State Blinken and Secretary of Defense Austin decided to prioritize Tokyo and Seoul as their first destination uh, as a major diplomatic initiative was precisely to try and overcome those differences and to signal the critical importance of alliance relations. How they will do that going forward will depend on developing common interests. Um, the area where I suppose we could expect the most progress is on defense spending. Um, and the agreement on the special measures agreement to increase Korea's defense spending by 14% over the coming year, the decision by Japan to um, roll over its existing burden sharing agreement with the United States is a sign that in military cooperation, Seoul and Tokyo are working very closely with the Americans. And we can probably expect more of that, especially from the Japanese, who are not only concerned about security risks in their own immediate waters in the East China Sea surrounding the Senkakus, but broadly also concern over Taiwan. It was very striking, I think, that the Japanese were willing to signal and single out the importance of Taiwan. And I think there has been a shift with the new administration to a posture where Washington and Tokyo are prepared to take much more forceful action if a crisis were to break out over Taiwan involving China. Now, that can't be, I think, overstressed as an important shift forward, alongside the importance of stressing the importance of nuclear deterrence as part of the broader security preparedness that the Japanese rely so heavily on the United States um, to provide support with. Um, and this is, I think, a further confirmation that increasingly Washington and its key allies in the region feel that their deterrence is perhaps being undermined steadily by China's own military expansion and more assertive and confident foreign policy. So, Riley, a lot of the focus here has been on security and strengthening uh, security interests in the Indo-Pacific among American allies, as John, John just pointed out. But um, at the end of the day, it does seem like a major factor is, well, money. Most of America's allies, they've become deeply interwoven with the Chinese economy, which is projected to grow by at least 6% in GDP this year. And it's generally attracting a lot of foreign investment, especially with its Belt and Road Initiative. Won't the US really have to offer some kind of alternative or um, economic incentives for its allies to really convince them to step away from doing business with Beijing? What do you think that the US could offer, um, offer its allies in Asia, especially South Korea? Well, I, you know, I often get this question, what can the U.S. offer? And I, I think the, there's a bit of a problem uh, there in that uh, it's often what can the U.S. government offer? And it, it often we often disregard what U.S. companies and what U.S. consumers already offer a lot of these countries. Um, for example, if you look at with South Korea, uh, you know, the U.S. is uh, South Korea's second largest trading partner it's its second largest investing partner, uh, you know, after the European Union. So there's already a very strong relationship there. And that really translates across many of these countries because the world, uh, the United States is the world's largest consumer in that regard. And so, um, you know, if, if we're looking for what the U.S. government can actually give, it's building stronger relationships. It's, it's building, you know, uh, as the Biden administration says, building back better, uh, building uh, greater diplomatic alliances, uh, you know, how much money we actually throw at some of these things doesn't always work out. It might, it might not actually produce the, the best benefits. Um, you know, uh, in, in the end, though, I think it's, it's relationships that really is, is what's going to matter. Um, and I think businesses are, are doing that already. It's, it's taking advantage of what's already on the ground there and sort of highlighting the relationship, the, the bilateral and multilateral relationships that we already have and, and, and showing that these are real and these are strong and that while Beijing can be uh, enticing sometimes, they, they come investing in China comes with its own costs, uh, even though sometimes they say, uh, you know, relationship with China comes with no strings attached. That's not always necessarily true. And so uh, when you're actually investing more in your alliances with uh, like-minded partners. I think there's 
a little something better to get out of that in the end. And so um, I, I, I think that's really what we can offer is, is better relationships than with Beijing. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time, so this is where we'll have to uh, finish the interview today. That was John Nilsson Rice at the Chatham House, and um, he's also the Senior Lecturer of Modern Japanese Studies at the University of Cambridge. We also had Riley Waters, Japan Chair, Deputy Director at the Hudson Institute. Thank you both so much for your time. Thank you very much. And to our viewers, as always, thank you for watching.